The Week in Art is brought to you in association with Christie's. Visit christies.com to find out more about the world's leading auction house since 1766. Auction, private sales, online, art anytime. Hello and welcome to The Week in Art. I'm Ben Luke. This week, in the aftermath of the killing of George Floyd, we talk about the history of black resistance in the US and how the art world can respond to this latest tragedy. Also this week, we pay tribute to Christo, who died earlier this week. With his collaborator and wife Jean-Claude, Christo most famously wrapped the Pont Neuf and the Reichstag in coloured fabric. And in the latest in our series of lonely works behind the doors of closed museums, Caro Howell, the director of the Foundling Museum in London, explores William Hogarth's portrait of Thomas Coram, the cornerstone of the Foundling's collection, which she now hasn't seen for months. Before we begin, a reminder that you can sign up to the Art Newspaper's free daily newsletter for all the latest stories. Go to theartnewspaper.com and the newsletter link is at the top right of the page. And while you're there, you can also sign up for our monthly newsletter, Art Market Eye, the latest of which is just out. Now, the Smithsonian's National Museum of African American History and Culture has just launched Talking About Race, a new portal on the museum's website which aims to help individuals, families and communities talk about racism, racial identity and how these forces influence every aspect of American culture. The online portal provides resources, the museum says, for educators, parents, caregivers and individuals committed to racial equality. The museum has brought forward the release of the portal due to a number of recent racially charged incidents, from an altercation in Central Park in New York to acts of police brutality resulting in the deaths of Breonna Taylor and, of course, last week in Minneapolis, George Floyd. These recent events have prompted the protests in cities around the US that have dominated the news ever since. The museum says that it hopes to help people and communities foster constructive discussions on one of the nation's most challenging topics, racism and its corrosive impact. Margaret Carrigan, one of our senior editors in New York, spoke to Spencer Crew, the interim director of the National Museum of African American History and Culture, about the Talking About Race online portal and the events that have provoked its early release. Dr. Crew, widespread protests have followed the murder of George Floyd by Minneapolis police last week. And adding to this urgent nationwide conversation about systemic racism and, and police violence, the National Museum of African American History and Culture launched a new online portal called Talking About Race, which provides all sorts of resources that unpack how racial identity shapes one's experience of American life. And I was reading on the museum's website that since it opened in 2016, how to talk about race has been one of the most frequent questions posed by visitors. And I think it's really telling then that the portal opens with a set of questions asking the reader when they first became aware of their own race and how differences were first explained to them. It underscores to me that racism is, is not just about self and other mentality, but it is more of an issue of self, that it is up to everyone, especially those who benefit from structural inequality, to first understand your own relationship to race before you can dismantle racism. So to that end, can you tell me a little bit about what went into developing the Talking About Race curriculum and, and how can individuals, educators, and, and even institutions use it? Well, I would say that our, our experiences in creating this portal about talking about race really emerges from a lot of the work of our education department, who has been having uh, workshops with teachers and others for several years along with programs we run in the museum that look at issues of social uh, injustice. And what we have learned are that, that it's, it's challenging at times for people to have comfort in talking about issues around race. And what we've tried to do uh, and learn from those sessions is to put together ways of opening up those conversations, of allowing people to relax, to ask the questions they really want to ask without feeling embarrassed, and in, and in that way creating, I think, very open conversations, tough conversations sometimes, but conversations that allow people to grow and to understand one another better. And as a consequence, I think, to better understand how their perceptions of themselves and the perceptions of others can influence how the society operates. And I think what we understand is that we each carry biases of different types, but we have to be aware of those biases and understand how we manifest them so that we do it in a way that works towards a more equalized society and the treatment of people as people rather than giving them designations because of what we perceive about them initially. 
Yeah, very well put. You know, the, the museum has looks at African-American culture by virtue of its name, obviously. And um, there are so many excellent historical artifacts in the museum's collection that show um, how this conversation has been developing over centuries. And especially, I, I wanna focus on those, those artifacts within the museum that show the history of resistance to white supremacy within this country. And that includes everything from you know, Rosa Parks' dress from the day she refused to give up her seat on a bus in Montgomery, Alabama, um, a segregated Southern railway car from the Jim Crow era, stools from the Greensboro, North Carolina lunch counter that spawned sit-ins across the South in protest of segregation. And I personally remember being blown away by the works of art, writing, media, et cetera, related to the Black Panther Party, um, a resistance group founded in 1966 and, and the era's most influential militant Black power organization that confronted politicians, challenged the police, and, and protected Black citizens from brutality. I mean, I, I truly, I was shocked by how little I really knew about the movement. And I'm sure that's, you know, in some ways by design of the education system I was put through. And, and in some ways by, by dint of my own white privilege of not feeling like it was something I needed to research more on my own time prior to that point. So I'm curious, you know, the Black Lives Matter movement over the past several years is proving another incredibly powerful force of resistance. And it is part and parcel of the protests that we're seeing now over the past couple of weeks. I'd love to know of some other examples of how the museum contextualizes protests and resistance and how is the museum collecting, documenting, contextualizing the important Black American history that is unfolding as we speak? Well, uh, I think it's important to understand when you visit the museum, one of the foundational experiences when you come to the museum is we have a history section that is an important part of the experience of all visitors. And essentially what that history section does is to offer a perspective of African-American history, but also, offer also African-American resistance and efforts to create change in this country, going from the pre-colonial period all the way up through the second inauguration of uh, President Obama. So what we are trying to provide is a sense that this has been a long, continuous effort on the part of the African-American community that it's been an effort that's been joined by a sympathetic and supportive and understanding others who helped to make that movement go forward. And it sort of is a backbone for the experience for visitors in our museum. When they first come in, we want them to go through the history exhibits so that they can then understand what that history is. And in the course of that, we talk about a number of different kind of resistance efforts that have, I think, uh, characterized the African-American experience. Going from that Turner, to the March on Washington that, uh, that was supposed to take place during World War II, to the March on Washington in 1963, to Malcolm X, to the, uh, to the Panthers, to the civil rights activities of the 1950s and the 1960s. I think what they illustrate is, as you've said, a long history of resistance to the way the country is performing. I think what we believe is that very often the African-American community and those who work with them are trying to be the conscience for this nation and remind them that we are founded on these, this really remarkable document called the Constitution that has evolved over time, and that it really creates a wonderful foundation for a true democracy. And what we need to strive to accomplish as a nation is to really be that democracy that's described there. So that uh, throughout the experiences of the museum, you will see historical moments that help to punctuate the fact that this is a long struggle, it's a struggle that needs allies who are understanding the issues facing this community and that uh, the, the Black Lives Matter activities now and the things you see in the, in the streets now are part and parcel of that ongoing effort to really make this country live up to the standards it's set in the Constitution and the amendments that are connected to it. You know, it's part of the museum's mission to provide this kind of research and scholarship and representation of African American history up until this point and, and cultural artifacts that have accompanied that. And there has been a long critique also of other museums that they don't do enough of that, even when it comes to contemporary art and culture being made in the here and now. Mm -hmm. um, and in the past few days, the calls for institutions to be more anti-racist, not just within the scope of what they present, but in the way that they do business from making donations to black causes and bail funds right now to reviewing the demographic breakdown of their own staffs and boards. This has 
obviously been an ongoing conversation for many museums even before now, but it seems to be reaching a critical and necessary juncture currently. Do you think that the National Museum of African American History and Culture can perhaps provide a valuable guide to what other institutions can do to be more anti-racist in their mission and programming, having been uh, yes, I do think the African American Museum uh, can provide, I think, guidance and uh, possibilities for how other museums can operate. I think from the very beginning, we have believed that the idea of diversity in your staff, diversity in your uh, board of governors, diver diversity in the presentation that you make are an important way of um, showing the diversity and the richness of American history and culture. I think for a long time, the challenges for museums in general across the country has been, how do you make yourself of value to the community in which you exist? And uh, the way you do that is to make sure that people from that community are represented in that museum, are represented in the presentations that you make and the programs that you do, and the issues that you try to raise as part of the presentations of that museum. And we have tried to do that from the very beginning to look at issues of social justice, to uh, get our visitors to understand better the richness and the diversity of American history and why it's important to recognize that, to understand why that's the strength of this nation, not something to recoil from or to be fearful about. I think what, you, what you're saying about, you know, what can museums do for their community as, and, and trying to respond to this need for community now, how do we rethink the role of museums at large going forward as we fight for a more inclusive society? And, and to what end do maybe some of the current events happening now are they sparking conversations about what your museum may, may do? I mean, obviously it's still closed because of the pandemic, but once it reopens, are you rethinking new ways to present information? Well, I, I think what we have learned, especially with the pandemic, is that an important way of our reaching our visitors and our, our, our supporters is through the web and through portals like this uh, Thinking About Race that uh, social media and other ways of uh, uh, using uh, these kind of portals are an important way to, to reach out to uh, people who turn to us for information. I mean, what this portal does is to offer guidance and support videos, programs, digital activities for teachers, for caregivers, for people who want to figure out how to be better citizens in this society. And I think that's going to be an important facet of how we work and how many museums work going forward. And I think it's critical that as we're done with thinking about race is to look at issues that are relevant to the society at the moment and to remain relevant as a institution in terms of the kind of work that you do. That's always been in the forefront of the work that we've done as a museum. We've done social justice programs of all types uh, since our very beginning. And our idea will be to continue to do this and to reinforce that going forward to make sure we continue to raise questions that are important for the society and for our members to think about and to figure out how they can act in a way to make this a more just society. Thank you so much for speaking with us today, Dr. Crew. Sure, thank you for doing the interview. You can find the Talking About Race portal at the museum's website. That's nmaahc.si.edu. And you can read a number of stories about current events in the US online at theartnewspaper.com or on our app for iOS, which you can get at the App Store. They include an opinion piece on the art world's response by Margaret, a story on the Walker Art Centre in Minneapolis's decision to stop working with the city's police on their security by Nancy Kenny, and Gabriella Angeletti's story about protesters' attacks on Confederate statues. We will, of course, continue following the art world's response to the aftermath of George Floyd's killing. In a moment, we'll look at William Hogarth's portrait of Thomas Coram. But first, here are a few of the top stories on the art newspaper's website this week. The German government has earmarked 1 billion euros for arts and culture in a 130 billion stimulus package announced on Wednesday by Chancellor Angela Merkel, Catherine Hickley writes. The initiative will counter what she described as the severest economic crisis in the history of the Federal Republic, caused by the coronavirus pandemic. The funds for art and culture, equivalent to half the annual federal budget, are set to be released this year and next under a programme called New Start for Culture. Tate Modern and Tate Britain are intending to reopen in August, according to the Tate's director, Maria Balshaw, who spoke to the art newspaper's Martin Bailey. 
Bauschel added that if there's an increase in the coronavirus infection levels, the Tate would necessarily have to change these plans. Asked if other national museums had the same date in mind, she responded that each museum is in a different situation. We are coordinating our schedules, she said, and she added that the reopenings would likely be staggered from mid-July until the end of August. And finally, while Amsterdam's major museums were closed in lockdown, a privately funded start-up museum dedicated to new media art has spent the past two months preparing to open in the city. Hannah McGiven writes that the next museum, located in a 2,100 square metre former recording studio in Amsterdam Nord, the post-industrial creative district, will open on the 29th of August and will show immersive installations by Dutch and international artists, designers, technologists and scientists. It's billed as the Netherlands' first new media art museum. You can read these and a wealth of other stories at theartnewspaper.com or on the app. We'll be back after this. The Week in Art is brought to you in association with Christie's. As collectors and art lovers look online to browse and purchase, Christie's has responded to the current climate with an expanded online-only auction calendar. This June, Christie's will present Classic Week as an online-only sales series of five auctions that includes elegant and timeless pieces from antiquities, books and manuscripts, 19th century paintings and old master paintings and sculpture. Discover and bid on an array of extraordinary works which exemplify harmony and restraint and define standards of form and craftsmanship. Find out more on christies.com. Now, for the latest in our Lonely Work series, in which we explore art in museums that have closed because of the coronavirus, Caro Howe, the director of the Founding Museum in London, tells us about a work in her own museum, William Hogarth's portrait of Thomas Coram, the founder of the Founding Museum. You can see an image of the painting if you go to theartnewspaper.com, click on the podcast link and look for this episode. Caro, this is the first time in this series that we're actually talking to a museum director about a work in their museum. So tell me, when was the last time you saw this work? I saw it on the 17th of March when we uh, closed to the public and um, I've been back to the museum twice since, one to pick up my chair and my printer and one about a week ago to um, film our temporary exhibition and in both cases the picture gallery was locked so he was there but I couldn't see him. So tell me because I'd imagine that this is probably the picture almost like the go-to picture to explain everything about the family museum and the hospital etc so you would see it normally every single day right? Every day it, it, it lies at the heart of our collection it lies at the heart of our 300 year old story it encapsulates all of the narratives uh, that we tell most particularly the idea of the agency of the artist in society, what an artist can do in the world that nobody else can, and this extraordinary relationship between William Hogarth, the painter, and Thomas Coram, the sitter, uh, is, as I said, is is really everything that we're about. But also, because because Coram's campaigning, his sort of sense of social justice, because his campaign took him over seventeen years to realise. It's a very, as a as a director of a small independent museum, who um, there the, the challenges are numerous, and this is before uh, the coronavirus. It's it probably sounds a bit naff, but it really is a painting you can stand in front of, and mentally tell yourself to keep going. It's okay, you know. People have faced bigger challenges. You will overcome, um, and also. Um, my granny's fantastic phrase which is always it's not about you dear so if you're ever feeling particularly you know sorry for yourself it's another great opportunity to stand in front of it and go pull yourself together it really isn't about you onwards so yeah it's very strange not to see him more or less every day and I've been at the foundling for nine years so my relationship with the painting I think has grown over that time because it is one of those paintings that depending on where you're at at any one moment, there's something about the painting that talks back to you and makes you feel better. So tell us who Coram was and, and, and explain what the Foundling Hospital was. So Thomas Coram was a, uh, a shipbuilder. Uh, he was somebody whose origins were very humble. Uh, he was sent to sea uh, in, uh, when he was 11 um, and uh was in his 20s sent to america this is the beginning of the 18th century sent to america massachusetts to set up the first um shipyard outside boston 
uh, and he met his American wife, uh, Eunice, there, and it was, I think, a love match, but they never had children. And Coram, uh, his moral compass was uh, incredibly strong and very fixed. He campaigned for all sorts of things in America, the end of primogeniture, land rights for the Mohican Indians. Um, he made lots of enemies. Um, and when he came back to London in uh, 1720s, he was appalled to see babies abandoned on doorsteps, rubbish heaps by families who, usually through reasons of poverty, couldn't afford to keep their children. And he decided to do something. Um, and he set about setting up the UK's first children's charity. And he needed the king's permission to set up a charity and a man like him, without social status, without sort of huge wealth, he needed the support of influential members of society. And for 10 years, he tried to get a single man of influence to sign his petition and nobody would. And eventually it was aristocratic ladies who supported him. And after 17 and a half years, he got his royal charter and he set up the Foundling Hospital. And the function of the Foundling Hospital was to take in babies. They were usually about two weeks old and to care for them, rear them, educate them, train them. And in a sense, uh, enable them to leave the hospital's care as young men and women with a proper training, stand on their own two feet and go forth and have successful lives. And at some point in his 17 years of campaigning, nobody knows when or how or why, his path crossed uh, with William Hogarth, the artist. And Hogarth had had a very interesting childhood. As a child, his father had been in prison for debt. And so Hogarth spent about four years of his childhood in prison um, with his mother and his sisters. Um, so he had a first-hand understanding of how easy it was for you know, good people to fall through the cracks and for families to find themselves in desperate situations unable to escape. And it's why he was trained as an engraver, um, originally engraving plate silver and then making prints, because he needed a job, he needed to make money. You know, he made the business cards and shop signs for his sisters and he, you know, he was a great entrepreneur and he taught himself to paint. But uh, he was somebody who, who had an equally fixed moral compass and again was childless, like Coram, but joined with Coram to help him in his campaign. And when the Royal Charter was finally granted in the November of 1739, in the spring of the following year, William Hogarth donated to the Foundling Hospital the first great work of art in its collection, which is this life-size portrait of Thomas Coram. And he then went about encouraging all of the leading contemporary artists of the day to donate work similarly. And so the hospital became simultaneously not only the UK's first children's charity, but also its first public art gallery. I and mean, that is an extraordinary thing, isn't it? Because it wasn't a vanity commission. It's not like Coram has instructed Hogarth to make this work. It's it's Hogarth's own sort of moral compulsion, right? Yes, yeah. And I think the, I mean, Hogarth's first uh, creative act for the hospital is fantastically practical and entrepreneurial. He comes up with the coat of arms. It's the brand, you know, that this is a brand new charity. It's the first of its kind. It needs a public recognition. So he creates this fantastic coat of arms that has a single uh, word motto in English, which is help, <laughs> which is incredibly, could not be more to the point if it tried. This is what we do. This is what we need. But then he also realised, you know, he's running the only art school in London at the time, the St Martin's Lane Academy. He's struggling to establish a school of British art because the received wisdom was that great art was French or Italian. And all the malords were coming back from the Grand Tour with armfuls of canalettos and large chunks of ancient Rome. And so he knew he needs a platform to really show off contemporary British art. His friend Thomas Coram is trying to get the kind of educated classes to make the journey outside London to to the Foundling Hospital, which in those days was beyond the city and in, in open countryside. It had all this empty, empty wall space. And Hogarth realised this is the win-win. We can show off the best that, you know, myself, Ramsey, Reynolds, Hudson, Gainsborough, or, you know, all of us, we can show off our work. And at the same time, we will give polite society a reason to come out to the hospital and see the work that the charity is doing. And within a couple of years, it became one of the most fashionable places in London to visit. And it was it was perfect. But your point is absolutely right. That initial gift was strategic, but it was unasked for. And it was it was generous. But it was about 
it's a real clarion call for social action, for social justice, about a bringing together of society and to look to your own skill set and go, what can I do as an artist to make the situation better, to galvanise society, to look at this social issue and to, to, to get involved? And this is how I can do it as a painter, but how can you do it as an architect or a sculptor or a man of letters or a lady who lunches? Um, everybody has a role to play. You said that um, Hogarth wasn't taught in the art of painting, and that's one of the most remarkable things about this work to me in the sense that there were all sorts of painterly orthodoxies about this work, but then there were lots of of things about it that actually undermine in a way the sort of grand manner portraiture right so take us through the kind of what those kind of i don't know the, the what more the more academic aspects perhaps are but also where hogarth really finds his own voice in this work yeah you know hogarth has really done the portrait in the style of the kind of baroque grand manner so it's full length uh it has a lot of the attributes that you'd expect so you know Coram is seated in front of a kind of classical pillar there's a far vista in the background of the seas and ships which obviously reference his sort of seafaring career there is, you know, the globe, the clutched glove, the kind of the, all of the the um, the accoutrements of a gentleman. Um, so really taking on in a painterly style, it, it's very much in the style of artists like Ramsey. But Hogarth, Hogarth's passionate belief, in a sense, that beauty lies in nature, that it doesn't necessarily have to be forced and follow rules, you know, and Palladian kind of structures, that that goodness that the 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 qualities of a great man it isn't simply about wealth and land ownership and education and that Coram is the opposite of all of these things he's very rough and ready as an individual he made lots of enemies he kind of you know hacked his way through problems rather than trying to kind of finesse with a nail file and but his moral goodness gives him in painterly terms the stature deserving of a grand man of portrait so you he's there life size but his clothes his fabulous red coat is incredibly rumpled um and sort of creased he isn't wearing a wig he's wearing his own hair um long hair so he clearly never wore a wig he you know which was very unusual for and certainly a, a, you know a, in polite society in the 18th century you wore a wig <laughs> um his he was quite short and hogarth has shown that his feet don't touch the ground they kind of dangle in the chair uh his face you know he spent a life outdoors building ships and supervising shipbuilders and his face is covered in little you know thread veins and sunburnt and his hands are all gnarled but he is he is a great man deserving of the grand manor because of his moral greatness not just through accident of birth one of the striking things, I mean, again, going back to the fact that he wasn't trained, is my word, what a painter Hogarth is. And it's, it's something that's often overlooked because of the content of his works, because of that sort of moral clarity and the kind of extraordinary satirical elements of his work. We're often just talking about the content, aren't we? We don't often talk about how great a painter Hogarth was. Absolutely. It just, the, the painting is beautiful and it moves from passages of very loose brushwork which is you know you can kind of feel the strokes that isn't it? it's like the handwriting through things that are uh, you know much more you know uh, thin layers of oil wash and beautiful light in the background it just and and the humanity he, he was an amazing portrait painter I mean I think if it's fair to say this is probably his I think his greatest portrait but you you could not have a clearer sense of Coram as a man. And that, that wonderful, that even though he's been given all of the kind of the, the grand manner attributes, it is actually friend to friend is this painting that you sense, even though we don't know how these two men met, you are left in no doubt of the mutual respect and admiration and love that they had for each other and the twinkle in Coram's eyes and... Yeah, the sense that you feel that he just is going to get up off the chair and go and do something. And in fact, Cor you know, that, that, that Hogarth has got him still for a matter of only a few minutes because he was not a man to stay sat for long. And I think that sense of humanity um, and wit is what comes through. But as you say, as a piece of painting, it's beautiful to look at too. And finally, is it, is it right that Hogarth himself esteemed it as his sort of highest achievement, I mean, which is quite something if you think about Marigella Mode in the National and those extraordinary series in, in the John Soane's Museum and everything else. 
Yes, yes. And I think, but also, isn't it, it's about the painting, the painting contains so much. It's about the establishing of a British art world. It's about the establishing of a children's charity. It's about realising dreams. It's about achieving social justice for really the voiceless and the most um, disadvantaged in society. It's about, and of course, it's about human lives. So in this work are over 25,000 children who made their way through the founding hospital. And that is extraordinary to be the director of an institution where you will have members of the public come up and identify themselves as, as descendants of, of children who went, who grew up in the founding hospital. That's, that sends shivers down your spine and that sense of quiet satisfaction and triumph in that painting that what that contains and two men who against the odds be both Hogarth and Coram they set up a different system they beat the system they were born into and they set up a new one that was a better one and really left legacies both creatively artistically and also in terms of childcare in this country that I think is is outstanding and <laughs> yes uh, lessons to us all to put our backs into it and make things better well Caro, i hope you and everyone else can go and see this picture again very soon thank you You can find out more about the painting, Thomas Coram, and the history of the Foundling at foundlingmuseum.org.uk. And finally, the Bulgarian-born artist Christo died earlier this week. He was 84. Christo is, of course, best known for his dramatic public projects made alongside his partner in work and life, Jean-Claude, most famously the wrapping of historic buildings like the Reichstag in Berlin and natural phenomena like a coastline in Australia. He was due to wrap the Arc de Triomphe in Paris this autumn, but that project was postponed until next year because of the coronavirus. The last major sculptural project he completed did not involve fabric. The London Mastaba was a vast structure constructed from thousands of oil drums that appeared to float on the Serpentine Lake in London's Hyde Park. Melissa Blanchflower is a curator at the Serpentine Galleries in London who worked with Christo on that project and the accompanying exhibition at the Serpentine Gallery. She joined me to talk about this visionary artist. But first, here's Christo himself in an interview with Louisa Buck for this podcast in 2018, describing how Crossing the Iron Curtain provided him with an ethos that sustained his art for the next five decades until his death. Uh, when the Hungarian Revolution started, I escaped alone, with no relatives, with no money, with nothing, to the West and Vienna. And I escaped because I like to do the things I like to do, to be free, to be totally irrational, absolutely free, with no justification, what I like to do, and I will not give one centimeter of my freedom for anything. Melissa, Christo always accompanied exhibitions with something new, and that was very much the case with the Serpentine exhibition that you worked with him on. Was that always a sort of condition in a way, that if he was going to look back to the past, he had to have a sort of something brand new and very much of the present to focus on? Well, Christo was very famous for always saying within his lifetime that he would never do a retrospective. He would never look back on the past in that kind of sense. So for him to make a new exhibition with an institution, it needed to have a connection to the present. And for him, uh, the conversations around the exhibition really came out of him visiting the gallery taking part in the Serpentine's Miracle Marathon in 2016 and taking a walk across the bridge through the park and seeing the uh, the lake. And Christo has spent you know, the last 40, 50 years realising sculptures and projects and temporary art, public art projects. Um, and I think in reality, he's he succeeded in realising around 23, but that's out of about 47 that he and Jean-Claude really tried to realize so he always goes back to his original kind of drawings often from the 60s and 70s and it was when he visited the serpentine that he thought of a proposal that he had made or had thought of and drawn about for a floating sculpture and so those those kind of magical elements of of realizing a sculpture that he's always wanted to do at this right place of the serpentine all started to align with the idea of also making an exhibition 
of his lesser known but no less um, important strand of his practice, his and Jean Claude's practice, that of using um, barrels as its medium. That's right, because the barrels were a very early formal language for Christo, weren't they? In a way, they kind of preceded everything. They were they were kind of the way he found his way into making sculptural work, right? That's right. He um, was living in Paris. Um, he was making portraits um, for a living at the time. Uh, and in the, at the time when he wasn't making portraits, he was making what he would consider his... Uh, his own art that he would only he would only sign with his name Christo and not his full surname um, and it was at that point in his studio in Paris that he started to experiment greatly with objects he had he had in the studio already so he started in fact making sculptural um, compositions and arrangements using his paint cans empty paint cans he then began to wrap those cans and kind of naturally with with kind of many artists who might be experimenting with a form, um, the scale then increased and the scale went to, into the, the large barrels that we, we, we saw in the exhibition. So what we really wanted to do with the exhibition was to reveal how the um, perhaps much more public-facing or kind of Christo and Jean Claude's work is very much recognised for their use of uh, using fabrics, of covering and wrapping landscapes, cityscapes, um, natural landscapes and, and monuments. Um, and really that, that practice really originated with the idea of these, these cylindrical forms, um, first of all in the paint cans and then in, and then in barrels. I mean, it was, it was interesting to me to expand the idea of what Christo and Jean-Claude's work consisted of because it, it, they are so, it, they almost had such a trademark with the fabric works that it was utterly surprising to see such a significant body of work which seemed to operate yeah it, there, there are there were moments of crossovers but for instance the Rue Visconti work the, the Iron Curtain you know with, where he blocked the Rue Visconti in Paris with with these um oil barrels and you know as a gesture which directly related to the to the Berlin Wall being built at the same time it really opened to me it really opened up his practice in a sense that in a way it's easy to divorce the projects that he and Jean-Claude did from, in a way, political realities. But that made clear that they operated within society as well as a sort of fantastical escape from society. Yes, I think the the question of uh, politics um, within Christo and Jean-Claude's work is something that's really fascinating. And you mentioned the the work which was named the Iron Curtain, which they which was one of the, the second public um, sculptural temporary work that Christo and Jean-Claude made when they assembled um, a barricade of, of barrels in a small street in Paris, which ultimately stopped traffic. Um, it only lasted long enough for um, them to document this um, and until the police asked them to take it down because they didn't have planning permission. And, of course, that... That particular work, it was in a reaction to the Berlin Wall, which went up a year prior to that um, and was very much also made in the context of the Algerian War and protests that were happening in Paris at the time. Um, I understand that from Christo that barricades or police stopping people on the streets or, or stopping traffic, blocking off roads was something that was very commonplace at that time. And in those photographs, you can often see political graffiti on the walls of, of the, the Rue Visconti um, at that time, which really kind of places that work in a very political context, which is also accentuated by Christo um, Christo's uh, statelessness in the sense that he was a political refugee at this time. He had, he had left Bulgaria in the late 1950s for Paris um, to escape communism. And it's a very explicitly political work. And I think what Christo um, has always said is that interpretation of his work is it's a freedom that we all have and we can make within his practice. But also in terms of politics, he's when we think about other works that he's made, such as the Reichstag, of course, government building in in Berlin has a very very resonant moment in history but what's also interesting about that work is that he and Jean-Claude proposed to wrap the Reichstag um, I think back in the 1970s um, 1971 in fact and didn't manage to realize it until 1995 um, and so in a way a lot of his much of their practice was engaging with politics engaging with um politicians with governments, with city planners. Um, and for him, he felt that, that that was a political aspect of his practice. 
And that's really interesting, that, isn't it? He, I mean, he, he referred to the the hardware and the software periods, didn't he? This this, this idea mm. that there's this software period which would consist of a drawing, you know, the idea, having the idea, making the drawing, and then these negotiations. And as you say, they would very often involve politicians right right up to the top of governments. And, and, and that he saw that as all part of the work. And even though certain of the projects, as you said, weren't completed, those in a way they were completing themselves just through the fact that they existed in in software form uh even if they didn't exist in hardware form if you know what i mean yeah that's right and i think what's so fascinating about their their projects and their practice is that there are particular works that um they've proposed or have realized which are very very specific in sight um the reichstag is one of those <laughs> Um, but others often migrate uh, in the sense that um, I think probably the example of the London Mastaba is one of those is that the original idea of a, a floating sculpture in the shape of a Mastaba came about in the late 1960s but it was a, an idea that he thought of, of for Lake Michigan when once they'd kind of moved to the States and they must have visited um, but that idea of that location migrated to London eventually as a as a site to to realize that project. That's right, and he eventually was hoping, wasn't he, to build the biggest sculpture in the world. I think he was it was going to be in Abu Dhabi, and again, this was one of those sort of unrealized projects. But he was hoping to build the Abu Dhabi Mastaba, and, and in a way, the the London version was a sort of it, it's astonishing to use this term, but a, a miniature version of, of this version that would eventually have been in Abu Dhabi. Yes, I mean the scale between uh, the London Mastaba and the and the Mastaba that he had been planning with Jean-Claude since 1979 um, for the deserts in Abu Dhabi um, is is extreme. Um, in London, we had the sculpture was made up of 7,506 barrels. And for the UAE, for the desert Mastaba, um, they had been planning for 410 thousand barrels for a sculpture that would be would rise 150 meters um from the desert ground so a very kind of very different in kind of scale and ambition but um i think what we're really proud of with the serpentine project is that the mastaba on the the london mastaba on our serpentine lake was the largest that he had realized he's realized so far and it was the first mastaba sculpture that he that he had realised um, within a natural landscape. So um, previ- in previous um, Mastaba projects, they have often been made in collaboration with it, with exhibitions um, and within sites within institutions. Um, so it was the first opportunity for him to realise um, that uh, Mastaba structure, Mastaba sculpture outside within a within a, a particular kind of landscape. And this one choosing water um the surrounding serpentine lake as its site that's right and it, I, I was lucky enough to interview him and we were sitting in that cafe by the serpentine and looking out over the lake actually and it was really noticeable when i was talking to him how he's sort of fixing this site in his mind and there you know there's an incredible amount of planning we, we talked about the negotiations that that happen with politicians and all and, and, and that side of it but also obviously that the actual technical process of pulling this off is these were enormous engineering feats as well weren't they I mean they were they really strained every sinew to pull off these sort of remarkable engineering feats yes I mean the the planning um that goes into the projects um sometimes would 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 take decades um in our case it uh it took around two years of planning and construction and of course Krista collaborates um with so many different experts on projects so like you say and engineers um fabricators for the for the for the for the barrels that that make them specially for him um but also other aspects of planning which i found so kind of interesting and and love to talk about with Christo was that he would make he made a number of site visits to the serpentine and the the lake and the park and would spend time within the landscape looking at how the the, the light would fall and change throughout the day look at how uh, reflections would be cast within within the the lake from existing kind of boats and things that were there really really taking in this this site and and really thinking about what the exact angle that the that the mastaba would be anchored at um 
as its final position, installation position, if you like. And the care that went into that was was it was incredible. Um, of course, the collaboration with London Mustaba was very much connected with his relationship with the Royal Parks and with Westminster as well. And you'll notice that from some of the photographs um, that were iconic photographs taken of the work um, from the Serpentine Bridge that you can see the Houses of Parliament in the background. So the placement of the Mastaba was was very much in line with ensuring that that historical viewpoint um, across London, which is also a protected viewpoint, was was maintained and and worked with the sculpture and not against it, you know? Yeah. Uh, we talked about Jean-Claude and, I mean, he, he was enormously frank about it. I mean, it's, it's recorded on film too, of course. Their relationship was... Obviously, they were extremely close. They were born on the same day, um, at the same hour, I think Jean-Claude said. And mm-hmm. and they had this enormously tense relationship, worked very much together. I mean, Christo made the drawings, clearly. But in terms of the kind of realisation of the work, Jean-Claude was absolutely as instrumental to it as he was. And often that's forgotten, isn't it? Sometimes Christo is credited with the work and Jean-Claude is left out. But he was absolutely always insistent, as well as talking about these sort of rather hilarious bust-ups that they used to have um but he was absolutely insistent you know on on her vital importance to the realization of the work and her absolutely crediting her on an equal footing yes i mean it would have been a dream to have met jean-claude um and unfortunately of course we were we didn't um for this project as from all accounts she was an incredibly um articulate um and clever um woman and very effervescent um and was always described as a as a problem solver. She would cut through um, a lot of the problems that would arise in planning planning kind of projects as ambitious as theirs. And the kind of partnership I think between them that was obviously very kind of critical um, and could be argumentative um, really pushed that energy that they both had together as a partnership really push the projects forward in a way that they continued through their careers together to make projects that seemingly felt impossible into a reality. And of course, one of the one of those projects that had seemed impossible at various points, but finally it seems will happen, is sadly going to happen without Christo seeing it, which is the wrapping of the Art de Triomphe. This was something they planned many, many decades ago at first. Um, and he was working on this right up until the moment that he passed away. And in fact, it was due to happen this year, but because of coronavirus has been postponed until next year. Did you, did you talk to him about that? We didn't talk very much about the Paris project because um, he likes to keep a lot of um, a lot of the kind of future projects under wraps. <laughs> but what I know from certainly from it, from some conversations is that the idea for Paris came about in 1962 with some kind of photo, photo collages and, and drawings that he made. And that what one of the kind of, we've just spoken a bit, a little bit about his relationship with Jean-Claude, but also what's incredible about Christo and Jean-Claude's practice is that they have incorporated and they've worked with this, with, they've created these incredible working family of people who work, who've worked with them on projects in terms of logistics and planning for so many years now that for Paris, I'm completely sure that everything is completely organised um, according to Christo's and Jean-Claude's dreams and that his working family will be are there to put that all into action when they're able to next autumn um, in 2021. Of course, it was meant to be for this year, so everything would have been in place. That's right. And I mean, I mean you, when you say family, I mean, that's you, you literally mean family, don't you? Because members of both Christo's and Jean-Claude's families are actually in the studio and have been working with with them for years and, and, and they will carry that legacy on. Yes. Christo's nephew, Vladimir, was instrumental in the in many of the projects in the past decade or so. And Christo also worked very closely with Wolfgang Voltz, for instance, who's a photographer who's photographed his works for for four decades um so the 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 working family is made up of um nephews and (laughs) and actual family who are obviously very close but also other people who've worked with him for over 40 years when i interviewed him and i don't think 
he would have minded me saying this because it seemed to me that this was just the way he he was with everything. He was very exacting. He wanted he wanted to be asked serious questions and tough questions. And imagine he was like that to work with from a curatorial point of view. I presume he was he 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 was in a way very demanding, but ultimately quite a rewarding artist to work with. Yes, you're completely spot on there. Um, Christo, um, it was an incredible experience to work with him. Um, of course, Christo and Jean-Claude don't accept any, any funding towards their project. So they completely funded, self-funded, um, the, the London Mastaba on, on the lake and completely managed that. And so our exhibition at the Serpentine was very much as a, to act, very much acted as a contextualization to this project. And, um, and of course, he had a very clear idea about what what um, he wanted the exhibition to to look like, and a very clear idea about his history of of using, um, of course, of using kind of barrel forms within his artwork. So, it the, the the form of the exhibition kind of came together very quickly because I think he you know he'd very much dreamt up how he wanted how he wanted and envisaged that that narrative to be. But of course, he he's an incredibly um, exciting artist to have conversations about uh, his work with to challenge him um, and so there are there were lots of areas where we were able to bring out a lot of our interpretation of his work within within our exhibition too so um, it was a kind of it was a great unique conversation that we were able to have because um, myself and Hans Ulrich our artistic director and Joseph Constable are um, the assistant curator on the project. One of the things that struck me was that you know some artists are not great historians of their own work are they you know you meet an artist and they're so focused on the current project that they won't actually be able to reflect much on the work that they've done in the past but he seemed to know in incredible detail everything about every project he'd worked on you know down to the measurements and things like that that, that struck me as being really remarkable actually. Yes his knowledge of of projects and the documentation around those projects and his the ability to retain so much technical information um was is is incredible um and you talk about measurements there's also a particular height that he he prefers his work to be hung so we so we followed that within within our exhibition and of course um it works perfectly and the the the, the kind of key the kind of core thing with um working on exciting projects with living artists is that he'd spent the last 40, 50 years exhibiting his work and he knows how to exhibit it. So his advice was invaluable in terms of composing and, and installing this, this kind of exhibition to this detail. OK, well, Melissa, thanks for telling us about this remarkable artist and thank you for joining us on the podcast. Thank you for having me. And you can read one of Christo's last interviews from just a couple of months ago on theartnewspaper.com or on the app. And that's it for this week. You can subscribe to The Art Newspaper at the website. Click on the subscribe link at the top left of the homepage. Please subscribe to this podcast if you haven't already and give us a rating or review if you've enjoyed it. You can also find us on Twitter at Tan Audio and on Facebook and Instagram, of course. The producers of The Week in Art are Julia Mahalska, Amy Dawson and David Clack. And David is also the editor. Thanks to Margaret, Spencer, to Caro and to Melissa. And thank you for listening. We'll see you next week. Bye for now. The Week in Art is brought to you in association with Christie's. Visit christies.com to find out more about the world's leading auction house since 1766. Auction, private sales, online, art, anytime.